Welcome back everyone to .NET Conf. I'm so excited to be here with everyone to show you what's brand new in the world of cross-platform mobile development with Xamarin. So this morning, uh, Miguel showed a lot of the Embedinator, which was cool, and the Xamarin Live Player. I have about 50, 60 minutes or so to go through the entire landscape of mobile development and everything that's new in Visual Studio and Xamarin, including some awesome demos in Visual Studio for Mac. So I'm going to kind of go through a whirlwind tour of everything that's brand new. First, I'll introduce myself just a little bit in case you don't know who this gentleman is in front of you. I'm James Montemagna. I'm a Principal Program Manager here at Microsoft, uh, formerly on the Xamarin team at Xamarin, and I've been a mobile developer for over six years now. Uh, I live here in this bright, sunshiny city of Seattle, Washington, where I drink way too much coffee and build tons of great mobile applications. I love every single part of my job, not only coming here to .NET Conf or other conferences around the world, but building awesome apps and libraries, essentially anything to enable developers to build awesome apps even faster. You can find me anytime, Microsoft.com, montemagno.com is my blog, and at James Montemagno if you want to hear more awesome stuff anytime. I also have some great shows right here on Channel 9. The Xamarin Show is a weekly show every single Wednesday. Go to XamarinShow.com. It will bring you directly into the Channel 9 page, which is awesome, featuring tons of great community content, things that are new in Xamarin, and it's uh, every single Wednesday. And I also have a podcast called Merge Conflict. So if you want to hear more of James, yes, even more of me, you can tune in every week at MergeConflict.fm. All right, cool. Let's get into it. When I started building mobile applications uh, six years ago. My boss came into my office. I was like, I don't know, how am I going to build an iOS, Android, and a Windows application in just a few months? All I knew is that I was a C-sharp .NET Visual Studio developer. And I looked around at a lot of web technologies. I looked at uh, some other, you know, um, building things in the three different languages. And to me, I wanted to build beautiful native applications. So to me, it's always about three different things that are really important we want to deliver to our users and as developers we want to have access to. First is a great native user interface. So every single UI component we should have access to and any of the platforms. As developers, we want to get access to all of the great native APIs on each platform so we can really distinguish our app in the App Store or if we even release it into our business. We want to add unique features like beacons and Bluetooth and AirPlay and take access of all those brand new features as soon as a new operating system is released. And of course, we want great native performance. So for me, I want to have access and get the latest you know, updates to the APIs, but I want to click a button. It has to work. It has to be great. And that's where Xamarin comes in with our unique approach to mobile development. Essentially, you build out a shared C Sharp business logic backend. So, models, view models, RESTful service calls, SQL databases, Azure integration. Things are the same across all of the different platforms. And then you get access to 100% of the APIs in all platforms iOS, Android, Windows, and even Mac. And of course, you can share code across all of the platforms with .NET standard libraries, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. Now we build out the user interface in one of two ways. Miguel shows some kind of native user interface for iOS. You can have access to 100% of the APIs and user interface on every single platform. So whether you're developing iOS with storyboards, Android XML uh, for Android applications, or XAML for Windows applications, you have access to all that uh, UI and the APIs uh, in C Sharp. So you never have to write Objective C, Swift, or Java. Everything is in C Sharp. Now, what's cool here is that that shared C-sharp business logic layer is all that the business logic that can be shared instantly. And on average, our developers share around 70% of code across the platforms. Now, what's cool, though, is as we progress, developers want to have access and share even more code. And that's why we developed Xamarin Forms as a cross-platform user interface library to sit on top of that shared uh, C-sharp business logic layer. So this means you can share even more code and still create native user interfaces with a shared XAML user interface. But you still have access to every single API, no matter how you're developing the applications. Now, like I said, on average, developers share around 70% of code. And you're seeing some popular applications like iCircuit from my good friend Frank Kruger, who I do the podcast with, actually. And he shares anywhere between 70% on iOS all the way up to 90% of code on Windows for his applications. And these are in the native user interfaces. So he's building the UI three or four different times. 
Now, I built our Xamarin Evolve conference application last year, and that shared anywhere between 91 and 98 because I was developing with Xamarin Forms and using some of the code sharing strategies that I'll talk about today um, with a lot of these great open source initiatives. Now, what's great, of course, is that Xamarin is completely free, included in Visual Studio. So if you already have Visual Studio, you already have Xamarin to so start building iOS, Android, Mac, and Windows applications. And it's even included inside of the Community Edition. So if you have Community, either Mac or PC, with Visual Studio, you're good to go. And of course, everything is open source. So all of our .NET runtime, the tooling, the libraries, uh, all of our components and plugins, everything you're going to see is open source. You can go to open.xamarin.com to learn about all of our open source initiatives, part of the .NET Foundation. So let's get into it. I want to just jump right into code. I wanted to give you a, a quick overview, kind of 101, of how Xamarin works, what it is. And I want to build an actual application inside of Visual Studio 2017 using some of the brand new tools. So let me hop over to my desktop. I'm going to take a seat here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up um, Visual Studio right here. And I actually have my Android device that's going to be screen mirrored right here. So it's a physical Android device. Because um, I want to show you how you can get started really easily um, with Xamarin. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, everyone keeps talking all the time about cryptocurrency. It's this big thing. I don't understand anything about it, but I'm always talking to my boss, Joseph. He's always telling me I need to get in on it. I have no idea. But I did find one coin that I'm really interested in, which is the Dogecoin. And i um, big fan of the Doge and of the Shiba Inu. So what I wanted to do was build a coin client to track the Dogecoin in real time. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you the solution. I've gone into Visual Studio and said File New Project. And inside here, we see a bunch of Android templates, iOS templates, and even Apple TV templates as well. We have um, cross-platform templates to build qu uh, a quick cross-platform app. So that's what I've done here. But I've also brought in a um, some .NET standard libraries here. And I actually have an Azure Function application here. And what I'm going to do is run an Azure function that's going to actually get all of the Dogecoin values. So what I've done here in, this, in, the, in the getter here is I have a, a, a trigger that's running every 10 seconds or so to get the latest um, information um, from this uh, coin market cap. And what I did here is I went over, and we can kind of take a look at the API. And this is what's all being returned. So I, I created an Azure function so I can not only scale this, so I don't have to keep constantly run a web service or hit the service multiple times. I'm only going to be paying for the consumption. But I can also do additional computation. So I'm actually going to put this into blob storage, keep track of the, the coin data, and see it over time. Now, what's cool here is that I needed to get this into C Sharp. So I use this awesome website called quicktype.io. It's the uh, successor to JSON to C Sharp. And what's really cool here is that you can come in, select any of the JSON files that they have. So if you're interested in, um, here's Bitcoin or Reddit, for instance, you can see all of the actual JSON. And it gives you the JSON.NET um, implementation with partial classes, JSON properties. But what's really cool is it even extends it, not only by adding the partial, um, the, the JSON properties, but it even gives you serializers, converters, and simple partial classes to read it from a JSON. So what we can do is we can actually just paste that Dogecoin information right into QuickType.O, and then essentially bring all of that logic out back into our application. So that's how we did that. So I got that data model in. Now I have this running in an Azure function over here, uh, which is pretty great. And I'm going to be calling this from the app actual application. So we can minimize that out a little bit. Let's go ahead and get rid of a few of those. So now what I'm going to do is show you the actual application. I still have an Android, iOS, and Windows 10 application, so I can access any of the native features. But I have some services. So I have an iCoin service where I'm going to get a trend here. Essentially, this will be a task. It'll go hit that web request, pull it down uh, you know, every few seconds or so if, if I'm running it in real time. Uh, I have a design coin service. So I'm using the built-in Xamarin Forms dependency service to leverage that. So this way, I can actually design my application without having to hit the web request every single time. And this kind of pulls back some random numbers and, and randomizes the trend here, whether it be up or down. And then I have an actual coin service where I've commented out this dependency. This will go call the Azure function, 
pull down via HTTP client, and then use JSON.NET to deserialize that object, which is very cool. And it's also a simplified object. If we look at the coin trend, we can see it's only two values. And that's nice because I've taken this really complex, bloated JSON, and for my mobile app, I get a super quick, lightweight JSON file that's going to come down. OK, so here's what we need to do. We're going to build out a little bit of user interface. Uh, and the first thing I have here is this main view model, so essentially the code behind for it, anything that I'm going to put into the user interface. So there's a few properties. I have an observable collection here of uh, coin trends, so I could ac actually create a list view. I have the current coin value using some um, modern C sharp features. Is busy here, where I have a refresh command. And then I'm going to actually visualize the trend. Is it up? Is it down? Is it flat? And I even have an error message if something goes wrong. Now, the core of it here is this refresh. And this refresh is essentially going to uh, update the values for me, and if anything goes wrong, display the error message out. And that's kind of it at this point. I have a few little helper methods to invoke and update the property. All right, so what else do we have going on here? Uh, we also have a main page. So this is a full XAML-based uh, application. And what I've done here so far is just set the binding context of the page so I can start using this. Now, what I'm going to do here is instead of just opening up the XAML file and just starting to write a code and then redeploy, we're going to write this and develop it in real time. So I'm going to use the Xamarin Live player. I went to xamarin.com slash live. I downloaded uh, the actual Xamarin Live application right here on my Android device. And you're seeing it screen mirrored here over on I'm using Visor here, so this is the actual application that's running. Now, the Xamarin uh, Live player is really cool because it allows me to actually just over my local Wi-Fi, manage my devices. I'm going to come in, and I'm just going to go ahead and pair this device with the QR code. So there we go. I'm going to uh, pair it up, and now I can actually go ahead and deploy this uh, over the local Wi-Fi. So instead of having to compile it, I'm going to select the live player, hit debug, and what this will do is it will essentially send all of the files of this application over to the uh, live player application. And on the device, it's going to essentially compile and interpret the, actually it's not going to compile, it's just going to only interpret all of the files to run the application. And all we should see at this point is just a gray background with some padding. So it takes a few seconds, the first run as it's synchronizing all the files, and then after that it doesn't have it. So there's the coin, we can see that a title bar is up there. Now what's cool is that I could hit breakpoints, I can do whatever in my application, or if I just want to get it really fast, I could always say start without debugging, it just sends the file over in a non-debug session. But what we can do is I can also put it in my favorite mode, which is the live run current view. Now notice I selected the XAML file, and I went to Xamarin Live Player and live run this current view, and I'm going to tap on that. And notice that the toolbar went away. And what I can do at this point is I can just start um, modifying the user interface. So maybe I want to change it to light coral. It'll actually update in real time on my Android device, and it's running the application. So what's cool is I can just continue to actually build this out. So let's add some um, row definitions. There we go. And I'm going to add a row definition, and the first one here will be of 80. There we go. We'll add another row definition height of auto. There we go. And I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste this a few times. There we go. We'll make this one a star, and the bottom one 150. So we have our rows set up. Now at this point, I am going to start to visualize the up and down trends. So I'm going to say image, source, and I added to my iOS and Android applications some PNG files. So there we go. So I have an image there. I have arrow flat. There we go. I have arrow down and arrow up. All right, and as you can see, it's kind of waiting for me to reevaluate so the app updates in real time. Now, we don't want all three arrows coming up, so what we're going to do is actually come in and say is visible here. And we're going to create a binding to is flat, for instance. There we go. And it's actually going to execute my code in real time. So as I update these here, we'll have is flat, is down, and is up. So as it as it updates, we can see that it's executing that code, and now we only have that default of is flat. So cool. So now we can actually start to put in some information. So we have our flat. What I want to do now is add a label, and we'll put that at grid.row equal to 1. We'll add a horizontal option. We'll center it. 
We can set the font size equal to, let's say, 30. We'll set the text color to black. And then what we'll do here is we'll say text, and we'll add some complexity in here. We'll say a binding here to current coin value. And then I'll also do a string format. And string formats are cool because I can actually output this in a very specific way. So what I'll do here is I will then do a, um, a little binding here for the string format. And I'm going to then say value, so it outputs value, and I'll say 0 and 6. There we go. And at that point, we can close it off. And then it should reevaluate my value as long as everything is correct. And there we go. Now we have the value coming in with six decimals. There we go. That's looking pretty good. Let's add another label in here. And we're going to say grid.row equals to 2. And we'll say text equal to a binding of error message. There we go. So it's looking pretty good. And now at this point, I want to add some additional information in here. So maybe a list view, for instance. We'll add a list view. I'll say grid.row equal to 3. And now what we can do is kind of extend it a little bit more. So I'm going to say items source and say binding to coin trends. There we go. Open it up. And the last thing we're going to do here is add an image in grid.row. And we'll say 4. And we will then say aspect ratio to aspect fill. And we will then say source equals doge.jpg, because what is a demo without a Shiba in it? So now if everything is compiling, boom, there's our Shiba. Looking great. I love it. But we can add some margin in here to update it in real time. So we'll say that, negative 20, negative 20, negative 20. And now our doge will actually go ahead and fill up, and our Shiba is looking pretty great. But we notice that we don't have anything in this list view, and that's kind of a bummer. And that's because I have, I'm not actually updating the values. So what I did here is in the code behind, we can actually refresh the data here. So I'm just going to modify the code behind. And every five seconds, I'm going to try to refresh the actual user interface. So I'll hop back over, and let's come in. And um, we can also start to modify this. And we'll say background color equals light coral, just to actually sync it up. Sync it up. So now we're looking pretty OK. We're actually updating the values every five seconds. New data is coming in, which is pretty cool. And as it updates, we can see the trend. We have our application running in real time. I never had to stop, recompile, do anything for this application, which is kind of bananas. And I love it. Now, if you don't want to see it and modify it in real time, I can, of course, come in, say, stop live running that. The app's going to sit there. And you can just kind of continue on. So we can add an item template in here. And here, so we'll say item template. Looks good. We'll say data template. That's looking good. And we'll start to fill this in a little bit. So we'll say text cell. And I can say um, uh, text equals. And we'll just grab this binding because I like this binding a lot. There we go. Grab this, shove it in there. And this will be for each coin. So I'll say current value. There we go. And I'll say, let's say text color equals uh, white, for instance. We'll say detail of it. We'll say um, a binding to time display. And then we will say detail color equal to, we'll say black, for instance. See how that looks? Close it off. And now when I'm happy with my changes, like I did earlier, I could come back in and live run that current view. And as long as everything is in the correct spot, which it should be, now boom, my application is rerunning. It's coming in. Everything is kind of good to go at this point. Now, I've been running in against the sample service, and I could now do a full compilation. I could do anything. But I could also maybe see what this looks like on iOS, for instance. So let's actually take my iOS device that I have sitting over here. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and pair this uh, with Reflector. 7663. There we go. All right. Now my iPhone is here. And let's get a shot in the studio, if we can, of me actually holding up my iPhone. Um, on the front. There we go. So I'm holding this up. No wires. No wires. All right. So just over Wi-Fi. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to set the iOS now as my startup project. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and select the actual iPhone player and then launch the iPhone uh, Xamarin Live player right here on the device. So I've already paired it. I can come in and just hit debug. And just like that, this will then send over the files necessary, just like I did on Android. But now I'm going to be able to actually visualize this on my actual iOS device. 
So we'll get this running. It's going to, again, take a few seconds to send all the files and information over. But I love that I can actually now visualize it without having to recompile or do anything on my iOS or Android device. So there we go. There's my Doge. There's the coin values coming in. But what's really neat is that I can, I can actually swap the code in real time. So watch this. I'm going to come in and I'm going to go ahead and say, run this in live run current view. Sends over the current view. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come into my design service and I'm going to say, no longer use that, use my coin service. So now, this will take my changes that I had from earlier. Let's go ahead and make sure this is coming in in the, the live run one more time here. There we go. And now we're actually getting the real values coming and hitting that Azure function in real time. So I can see the real values of the Dogecoin at 0 0.000914 coming in. And every five seconds or so, we're going to get those new values coming in. I can modify the user interface. I can see my application running. And I have this application running on my device. I can go over to my manager and say, check this out. Look what I just literally built a Dogecoin tracker in just a few minutes, which is really awesome. I can see it on my iOS or Android device. And I didn't need anything. The only thing that's here is Visual Studio on my PC and my iOS or Android device. There's nothing else in between because the Xamarin Live Player just talks over the local Wi-Fi network, which is super awesome. All right. Now, let's, now that we have our application up and running, we have one, of course, extended a little bit more. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to swap back over to the slides just a little bit. And we're going to get rid of the, uh, let's get rid of the, uh, um, Get rid of this really quick here. We'll go ahead and stop mirroring that right there. Perfect. All right, cool. So now that we've started to build the application, the next point is that we really want to start taking and getting access to all those great APIs of the platforms. And we've done a lot to actually simplify development. I'm going to talk through a lot of the things that we've been doing in the open source to actually help you access native features faster and build better apps quicker. And the first thing that we've been doing, obviously, is working with .NET and making sure that we have .NET that runs absolutely everywhere. This is obviously going to be a big trend that you've heard a lot about today and previously and into the future as we really leverage .NET standard libraries as the de facto of sharing code across all of your applications. There's been in the past a lot of questions of PCL or shared or .NET standard. And I love .NET standard because as a library creator, I can create one library that goes absolutely everywhere. I can also use .NET Standard um, 2.0, which is compatible with Xamarin, to share that with my application or do a uh, create a DLL that will then be scaffolded and dis distributed through my organization. Now, shared projects are still really great if you need to actually access some native features here and there, but .NET Standard is the way going forward to really share code across all the platforms. We had a question earlier that came in about that, so I really wanted to address that because that's what it looks like. You have all these different platforms and more coming on all the time, whether it's IoT or games or AR or VR, no matter what, you're actually being able to share code across all these platforms with a simple API. Awesome. But what about this other stuff? What about the stuff in the actual applications? I talked about the shared business logic. You saw it right there. The user interface with shared XAML, the business logic to make the RESTful service calls. But what about this stuff up here? Well, these are any of the platform-specific APIs you need to call or customizations in the actual app um, user interface. Now, what we did to simplify that so you don't have to go learn the API three or four different times, we created plugins for Xamarin and Windows, which offers a common API to access the native features on each platform. So, for instance, accessing things like the microphone, camera, settings, GPS, um, connectivity, for instance, is a single API that you can access by just pulling in a single NuGet across all the different platforms. So let me show you what that looks like in this actual application. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and jump over uh, to a, uh, a finished version of it over here of the actual application. And we can see it's still the same coin service. I'm using all this here. But what I've done is I've added a few NuGet packages. And the first thing that I've done here is I actually went to xamarin.com slash plugins. And what I did is, I, I first read about what a plugin is, learned a little bit about how it can help my productivity in my applications. And then at the bottom here, there's a browse plugins for Xamarin. 
And what this will do is it'll take you to our open source Xamarin components page where all of our Android, um, iOS, Mac, and cross-platform plugins live, such as Facebook and Google APIs and Xamarin Auth. But down here are all of the community-provided plugins. So things such as audio recording, battery status, connectivity, cryptography, device information, um, embedded resources, file pickers, fingerprint, fast image loading, geolocation, uh, in-app billing, uh, media, messaging, all this stuff that you can access from a single API. So what I've done here is I've brought in my connectivity plugin. And these are all open source under MIT. So here I went to the connectivity plugin, and what I can see is actually the source code that's inside of here. So I can, if I want to, I can go into the Android source code and look at the implementation of all the source code and how this was implemented. So I can actually bring this into my own application if I wanted to. But most likely, I'll bring in the NuGet and work against the abstraction. So here is the interface that I have. I have some very easy ones like is, is connected, is reachable, is the remote server reachable, or what are the current bad, uh, bandwidths, or even subscribe to event and connection type changes while my application is running. And what's really cool here is that it's all open source so you can contribute and there's great documentation uh, as well. And there's even continuous integration feeds that you can tie into. And this thing supports everything from iOS, Apple TV, Android, UWP, Mac, and WPF. So all these great things here. So let's go ahead and bring in that plugin and my text-to-speech plugin. So what I'm going to do is right-click and say Manage NuGet Packages. And I've installed these ahead of time just for uh, time. But what I have here is my connectivity plugin, and I've installed it into iOS, Android, and my Windows application. And you would also install that into your .NET standard libraries or anything else. Uh, text-to-speech. We have our text-to-speech plugin right here um, as well. So what I can do is, from my shared code in my main view model, I can say, hey, before I go off and refresh this code, let me check the connectivity. So I'm going to go ahead and say, if not cross connectivity is the API dot current dot is connected, let me just go ahead and return. Right? There's no need to actually hit that. And at the end, if I am connected to the internet, let's do something a little bit different. Let's go ahead and um, do some. Um, let's do some text to speech. So I'll, I'll say text to speak back, and we'll use some. Some stuff here will say, if is up, then we will return is up. Uh, else, we'll say is down, and we'll do is down. Else is flat. There we go. So now we know what to speak back. And I'll just say cross text to speech dot current dot speak, and we'll speak the text. Now, this is asynchronous, so I can either wait on it or not, but we'll just go ahead and wait on it just for, just for good measure. And what I can do at this point is I'm going to actually compile up this application and deploy it on my actual Android or iOS or UWP device. So while that's compiling, we had a question come in about um, the Xamarin Live Player specifically. So actually putting on my iOS or Android device and you know, at some point, do you still need a back to build stuff? Absolutely. Um, for the Xamarin Live Player to get started, it's just um, your Visual Studio for Mac or Visual Studio for PC, one or the other, and it just communicates over Wi-Fi. Important there is it's not compiling your application. So it's really a getting started tool and a way to visualize your application in real time, uh, as I showed you um, earlier. And at some point, when you actually want to compile your application or use the remote simulator for Windows, you're going to be paired to a Mac. And I'm actually going to show you that here in a little bit. Um, so, and even to compile the application um, to submit it to the App Store, that'll also be done on a Mac. So, you know, that requirement is still there at some point. But to get started, we've lowered that barrier to really um, help get started faster. So, we're actually deploying now to my device. And what I'm going to do is going to screen mirror it on top of here. And this is currently connected to the Wi-Fi, which is good. Um, and we'll also have some audio coming back at the same time. So let's go ahead and see here as it hits the back end. There we go. So it launches our application. So now, as you can see, it actually took a little bit longer. I did a full compilation. I'm in a full debug session because I'm actually compiling a full APK for Android. And we can see the output is going crazy as it loads up the application. And now it'll start to output some uh, values here as it starts to hit the web server. Let's see if I have the audio up here. Is up. Is down. 
Now, this may not be the ideal scenario to do text speech back, but it is as we get up and down. Now, what's cool is I'll go ahead and put this in airplane mode. There we go. And what we'll see now is that there's actually an error message that's been displayed because there was an error occurred while sending this request. That was the last time. And now it's no longer going to update because it's actually coming in. It's going to hit this breakpoint right here because I'm no longer connected. So it's going to keep trying to connect over and over again, but it won't be able to because I've gone in and we've actually done this connectivity. Now, if I come back in, of course, and hopefully re-enable the Wi-Fi, it should start picking up the new processes uh, here in place. So as these start to come through, we should see the error messages and everything should start to kind of stream through again because I've not only checked for connectivity, but I've also been able to output that um, back into the application. So we get the error message, we get everything coming back in, and it should start to kick around as it speaks back um, the application. I can stop debugging, start debugging, and with actually just a few lines of code, I've gone in, checked for connectivity. I could also say, hey, cross-connectivity.current.connection dot, um, cross um, um, connection types, and am I connected to, um, uh, to Wi-Fi or to cellular? And I can actually look at that data that's coming in really easily. So for instance, you may want to take a look at what's going on um, there, which is really cool. But literally with just a few lines of code, I've done that. It doesn't stop with just um, connectivity or things like that. We have really advanced ones such as in-app billing, which I absolutely love, to do simplified in-app purchases and subscriptions. So you can come inside of here and read through the documentation of in-app billing, for instance, and say, oh, how do I get started or make a purchase? Well, all I have to do is use this method called purchase async pass it the product ID, and if it's a subscription or item, give it a payload, and bam, I've made a purchase with just a single line of code. I'll get the purchase back, or I can handle an exception coming in from the in-app billing exception. So literally, with just a few lines of code, not only doing simple things like connectivity, but also in-app billing, barcode scanning, anything that you can possibly think of using plugins for Xamarin and Windows. All right, cool. Let's take it a little bit further here. So, as we start to progress, we've gotten past the point where we've started to share the user interface, but we also are now sharing a bulk of our shared common APIs with plugins for Xamarin. But what about advanced 3D and 2D graphics? Well, that's where some awesome libraries come in, such as Skia Sharp. And I love Skia Sharp. It's essentially a cross platform 2D graphics engine, and it powers Google Chrome. Android and cross-platform with Android, iOS, Mac, and UWP, tvOS, and Windows Desktop to run absolutely everywhere from a shared user interface um, API. So you can do crazy things like draw vector shapes, uh, curves, translations, rotations, text rendering, shaders, path effects, all sorts of amazing things. It even has SVG loading built right in and it's GPU accelerated where possible. So you're going to get the best possible performance. Now, what's cool here is that there's been all sorts of companies that have not only been building plugins and libraries for Xamarin and Xamarin Forms, but many of them have standardized on using Skia Sharp for the cross-platform infrastructure, such as Infragistics and uh, Telerik. So Skia Sharp is actually powering all of this, which is really cool. What I want to do is show you Skia Sharp and how we can extend this application further. And I'm going to use a library called Microcharts, which is one of my new favorite open source projects and libraries um, uh, out there. So I'm actually going to pull up the GitHub page. There we go, Microcharts, where I'm going to say we've we practiced this. Aloise, I'm going to say it wrong, but that's okay. We practiced this, and he's going to make fun of me that there was no ex excuse for it. Um, I've made this cross-platform library to build super crazy simple charts across all platforms, including Xamarin Forms, leveraging Skia Sharp. So these are all cross-platform cross charts using this library. It's all just via a NuGet package leveraging that. So all these beautiful charts, and it's super easy because it's a .NET standard library. And there's even a Xamarin Forms layer that goes on top of it. And it's super crazy simple. You just add some entries, you add some Skia Sharp colors, and you get some charts. And you can visualize them easy right here in the code. So let's go back to our application, and let's actually do it. 
So I'm going to come back over into this here, and I'm going to right click and say Manage NuGet Packages. And what I've gone ahead and done is I've installed the microcharts.forms library, which has brought in the microcharts library and, of course, Skia Sharp. So here's Skia Sharp, which is being brought in as part of the Xamarin Forms Skia Sharp layer, which is really cool. So you see the Skia Sharp going across. Now, what's really rad here is that if I come into my backend uh, model, I've gone ahead and created a another observable collection of microchart entries. I have coin trends and entries. So what I'm going to do here in my cross-platform code is I'm going to come in and say, hey, um, if I'm up, let's set it to this color. If I'm flat, set it to this color or this color. So we have our different colors. And then what I'm going to do is every single time we have a new entry, I'm going to say, let's go ahead and get the current value and set the text color, text value, and the label here and just output six digits that's going across. Now in our XAML, our main page, I've gone ahead and added these a little bit earlier. So what I can do is I can first bring in the charts. So I'm going to bring in the microcharts here and the microcharts um, forms library. And instead of displaying our image of our Doge, what I'm going to go ahead and do here is I'm going to come in and first adjust some of these values here so our list view is visible. And I'm going to say, let's make this visible true. There we go. And this is it literally three or four lines of XAML to actually add in this chart. So I add the chart view, and it has a chart. It has a point view. It also has a line view. It has a bar chart. We can use the bar chart here. Um, and we have a chart name. Now what's cool is in the code behind for this, I don't actually have to do very much. All I've done here is I've simply um, set the current entries, and every time I update it, I update and invalidate and refresh the view here. So just a few lines of code. That's all I had to do. And I can simply now redeploy this application onto my actual um, Android device. So this will recompile, bring in all those microcharts using Skia Sharp as a cross-platform uh, user interface to do all of the drawing. So here we go. Bring these in. Loads it up into our full debug session. And now, as we start to bring in some values and hit the server, there we go. I'm going to also turn down the audio just in case. So now we have one because the, the downtrending is, is down. Let's go ahead and turn that. Oh, we have to get it's it. Down. Oh. It's down. So I can get the audio down. There we go. Perfect. So now we still have our list view, but we have charts coming in and we get these downtrends. What we're going to notice is over time, we're going to actually see this chart go down or up based on what's happening in the world of Dogecoin at this time. So we're actually getting all downward trends at this point, which is very interesting as it hits the server. Downward trends. Let's see if we get any upward trends here as well. So we're getting these bar charts. And if you actually zoom in, we'll actually see that, that we'll um, be getting a little bit different of a user interface as this downward or upwards trends in the UI. So now we're back up. So we can see it starts to go down, 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 and the Dogecoin gets a spike because everyone is probably mining for Doge currently. So there we go. We're down, we're down, we're trending, and everything is good right there. Back and forth, back and forth. Very cool. And I've compiled up this application. And the reason here um, that I've compiled up the application is that at this point, I've actually outgrown the live player for views. I have a lot of customization and Skia Sharp, so I'm compiling and putting it in here. And we had a question about what if my size limit is too big or as it grows. At that point, you have outgrown. You can always try to live run the current view or create a smaller library to extend that. And at some point, really, the live player is that starting um, point to get started there. Um, so here, as I said, I've compiled my application. But we can also see this chart coming over on, um, let's say, UWP. So let me start that as my startup here. We're going to get all of the same. I'm going to go ahead and comment out the uh, text-to-speech here real quick, just so it stops talking back. And now we're going to be using that actual line chart, um, a bar chart, over here on UWP. So let's go ahead and deploy it again. And we'll see those values come in. We'll just go ahead and minimize this a little bit here. We can see the two of them side by side as they start to hit that back end service. There we go. Now we're going to start to get those bar charts as they come in uh, right over here 
And here we go. We're trending up, we're trending down as we get those values in on both of them in real time, which is pretty spectacular and awesome. I've re reused all of that user interface across the different platforms. But it's even more than obviously I can do here with just the bar chart. I can customize that in many different ways. So if I wanted that to be a point chart, I change it to a point chart and then I recompile and deploy again. Now instead of using a bar chart here on UWP, this will actually display and render a point chart and we'll see over time. And I can use any of those. So I like this actually a lot better because it's only going to take up the very specific amount of space in this chart as it goes up and down based on it. I can set the axis, I can do a whole bunch of different things there, which is really cool. There we go. Now I'm starting to share some code and bring it all in. And I've now leveraged cross platform drawing, cross platform user interface, cross platform native libraries, and I'm sharing 100% of code across all three platforms here, which is really awesome. All right. Question came in, uh, which is good. I'll burn it. So, what are the advantages of using Xamarin and C Sharp for Android apps instead of Android Studio with Java? Well, that's a great question. As you can see here, there's a few different things. First and foremost is you have access to 100% of the Android libraries. Actually, if I right click here and say Manage NuGet Packages, we can see that I'm also bringing in all of the Android support libraries in here, all of the latest ones, including the latest V26 that are up in there. Also, Google Play services are all there. What's great is that you're going to leverage all the amazing C Sharp features that you can't in Java. So things such as auto properties, string interpolation, async await programming that's built into the actual language itself. So here, pulling in, using cross-platform plugins, coming in, doing async await to actually go off on a background task, come back um, when it's done back on the UI automatically. That's what's happening with this single call. Using a cross-platform deserializer, being able to share code with iOS, Android, your server, your Mac, Windows applications, your Mac applications there, and you're using the world's best IDE, Visual Studio, and all the great tools built in. I fell in love with C Sharp, and I love everything about it. Very cool. So that hopefully gives you some definition of it. I love C Sharp. I've been a C Sharp developer. I like to capitalize a lot of things <laughs> automatically. And here we can actually see what's going on here. We see all those bar charts and everything going on, which is super cool. So as it continues to run, which is super rad. All right. So cross-platform 2D graphics are great, but we can even leverage additional libraries with Urho Sharp. And Urho Sharp is a 3D retain graphics engine that works across Android, iOS, Mac, tvOS, and it's ready for AR and VR. It does all sorts of amazing things such as 3D scenes, game programming, but it also does some really cool things such as work with the HoloLens um, automatically from a cross-platform C Sharp API. So you can have a, uh, an actual HoloLens extension or use the brand new um, AR kit and, and, and VR type features to interact with um, the physical world uh, as well. So here are some really cool examples of using Urho Sharp from a cross-platform API. Now, we've made this really easy because I want to talk about the additions to using Xamarin and these awesome libraries that are coming out. So what we have here, I'm going to go to developer.xamarin.com. And to learn a lot of these cross-platform uh, APIs, we're going to go ahead and leverage Xamarin Workbooks, which is a tool that ships with Visual Studio and Visual Studio for Mac to help you learn all of these great concepts from learning about iOS, Android, um, 2D drawing, pop-up menus, trying Azure, trying charts, um, C Sharp here, graphics, anything like that. And that's where we're actually going to use Urho Sharp right here to learn about it. So what I've done is I've learned about creating compound shapes. So for instance, how do I learn that? So I one-click download a workbook onto my desktop. And I've actually gone ahead and done that already here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to my desktop. I'm going to go ahead and double tap on that actual um, um, Urho Sharp application. What this is going to do is it's going to learn this workbook. So I'm kind of outside of Visual Studio, but I'm still curious about learning these different APIs. And because maybe I want to integrate this into my app, maybe I don't. It works across platform with, with Xamarin Forms 2, which is really cool. And it's just a simple uh, desktop application that I can load, and I can essentially read and do. So for instance, here I'm going to learn about bringing in urho.dll and the different uh, interfaces or, that I need. I can just control enter, and essentially it'll run the code right here and launch an actual 3D uh, view. 
Now this is a little bit big, so let's make it a little bit smaller. Let's say 600, 600 here. I'm just going to go ahead and um, control enter. It's going to redeploy that application so it's a little bit smaller. So you can modify the code inside of workbooks, which is really cool. So here I'm just going to go and I can learn about setting the camera. I can learn about the nodes that are coming in. And what we're going to do is build a quad chopper, quad, quad copter here. So what we can do is we can actually start to learn about the nodes, how Urho Sharp works, and actually executing the code. So here I can actually come in, I can move around, interact with it with my actual mouse, uh, or actually um, touch it with my Surface Book here. And we can learn that I've just made, um, a, well then a node, a copter node, that I've named it, and a body node, and I've created a compound um, element, and I've set it to red. Now we'll also learn about some natural lighting and some ambient lighting here, which is really cool, and I can just execute it there. And notice that it actually got you know, a little bit of the lighting, so I've set a light source here. So as I move around, we can see the lighting actually change, which is really cool. And this is a big workbook, so as I go through, I'm going to learn about the colors and finish the actual lighting that's coming on, so we can see it actually change there where I'm setting my light source. And this is cool because I can build interactive models, but I can also interact with it if I'm building games. So let's go here and let's build a quadcopter arm. So I'm going to add another child node. I'm going to add a cylinder and just put it right in the middle. So here I've created a compound cylinder, one or two lines of C-sharp code to add it there. And then I'm going to scale it. I'm going to rotate it. I'm going to set the position right there. So now I have this on the back, which is looking pretty good. And what I love here is that I can come in and learn about how I can then position it. So I actually add a little, um, a little one right here. So that I'm going to go ahead and and see the little, um, little arm on the back. So now what we're going to do is start adding some blades. So I'm going to add some vectors, um, come in, create some more spheres that are coming in off the back. Again, I'm going to scale those down. One click, I see the scale essentially to smush it down so it now it looks like a blade here. I'm going to add another um, uh, blade here and then rotate it. So now i got a little blade coming in, a little bit of interactive learning here. There we go. I'm going to come in, add some um, green grass as my background and learn about how to set that as my plane. So now my, my, my copter is going pretty good. I'm going to set uh, the background sky, which is pretty cool. Again, one view. But what I'm, what I'm noticing here is that it's actually just markdown and I'm executing the code but learning what a viewpoint is, what a simple application is. And then I can start adding some additional things such as a light source shadow. A light source shadow. So let's go through. Let's finish this off. I'm going to come in, run an action here and rotate it. So really just one action. I can then come in and say repeat that forever and let's go ahead and run those actions. So learning about rotations, animations, and now we can just start actually cloning all of this. So I'm going to go and I'm just going to rotate it and add some more arms in here and let's add the last one in here. So let's go ahead and add that last one in there. It's looking pretty good. Now we've built this out literally just going through this actual application and the last thing that I can do is start to pull in some manual controls. So WSAD, moving the camera back and forth, and I'm just going to go down and then execute the processing of these keys. So literally a lot to learn here, but I'm coming in and my copter is now just flying around. I can then add those key values here, and now I can just start modifying and moving this copter back and forth. So what I like here is that I'm actually learning in real time of how to actually modify, update, and build a 3D application without having to recompile or do anything with workbooks. And workbooks are really cool when you want to learn about a new library. As a library creator, you can create your own right there. Cool. So I wanted to show you a little bit because I thought it was really cool just to kind of show actually Urho Sharp a little bit there. A few questions as we go on. So design time data uh, for scenarios there. I actually showed design time data in my, in my view models of using the dependency, using an interface base first to actually have a design time view. So that's what I would do and write in the actual Xamarin Live Player. Next, we have one about Xamarin Forms support .NET standard. They already support .NET standard. The latest releases of Xamarin Forms support it. In fact, you can always install a PCL into a .NET standard library, and we'll be updating the templates um, actually really soon uh, to actually just generate a .NET standard library as a shared code base. So great questions. Let's talk about Xamarin Forms. Getting a lot of good questions, and that's what I've used quite a bit here. And what we can see is that with Xamarin, 
itself, Xamarin native traditional approach, we have access to 100% of the APIs, sharing a bulk of our business logic, and Xamarin Forms adds in that optional actual shared code layer. And what's cool is that it's coming to brand new platforms. It's always supported iOS, Android, um, Windows 10, and older Windows phone and desktop platforms. We're adding macOS, WPF, and even Linux support coming out. And macOS support is already out there, and the Samsung Tizen is already out there as well. So those two platforms are available, and macOS is in the pre-release NuGet available today. So there's some really cool examples of applications built with .NET, and Xamarin Forms for the user interface for the Tizen platform to build for the TV, which I believe there's a, a session later on here at .NET Conf. But also for Linux, there's a little tip calculator. So a Xamarin Forms application running actually using GTK on a Linux desktop. Really cool. What I want to do is show you it running on a Mac. So let's hop over to my Mac really quick. Now what I did is I broke away from that actual uh, application earlier. Let's see if we can get the Mac up top on the screen, cool. So what I've done here is I've gone in to this actual application. And this is the same coin client that I showed earlier. I still have my Android, iOS uh, applications and my UWP application, but I've added a Mac application. And I did that by saying add new project. And over here, you can come in and add any project such as cross-platform templates, iOS, Android, .NET Core applications, including ASP.NET Core, if I want to create another web API for the back end here, uh, tvOS applications if I wanted to extend it there, or I've added a Mac desktop app right there. Now, it took very little to get started here. All I've done is added in the NuGet packages that I was using. So I added Xamarin Forms, the actual pre-release here. I've added in uh, those Skia Sharp and MicroCharts right there, which is really cool, and JSON.NET, because all of these libraries with .NET Standard all work across all the Xamarin platforms, including Mac. Now, the only thing I had to do is come in and change my actual app start code. So here, what I can see for my Mac app is instead of using an application delegate for my Mac app, I'm using a Forms application delegate. And I here, I go ahead and add some core graphics, give it a window size, and then when it finished launching, I say load app. And now I can just say run. I've made no other changes to the app code, and now it's going off using those micro charts that we saw earlier, pulling in all that data in real time. So it's using the charts, it's using the libraries, it's hitting that Azure function that I'm sharing code across with .NET standard libraries and the user interface all built with cross-platform XAML all in one place. I didn't have to do any work, and now I have a beautiful native, um, I could probably change the colors to make it even more beautiful, but now I have that native um, Mac application, so no matter where I'm developing, I have it everywhere, which is great. There we go. And some other questions came in and said, well, what about ADAL libraries? How can I use some other things? And I actually have a show here with Vittorio on Xamarin Show. So go to XamarinShow.com and check that out to learn about ADAL and Microsoft authentication libraries and easily integrating them there, which is great. And we actually use those and some really cool things uh, upcoming for that. One more thing I want to talk about with Xamarin Forms as we extend, we also want to give you the ability to embed. So the idea here is maybe you've started with a Xamarin native application or you really have a complex user interface that's doing a lot of things such as a lot of images or graphics or um, video playback or audio playback. You want that rich control and I love Xamarin native. I love crafting the native user interface for iOS and Android and Windows. But what I also love is the ability to kind of share that user interface and that's where Xamarin Forms embedding comes in. So for instance, Normally, we just have that shared C-sharp logic layer, and you have to choose between Xamarin Native or Xamarin Forms. But with Xamarin Forms embedding, it enables you to embed a Xamarin Forms page into your actual iOS, Android, or Windows applications. It works with any content page, and you can still use the dependency service and messaging center. So for instance, here's actually the calls, what it would look like to embed a full Xamarin Forms list view page in iOS, Android, and UWP. It's a single call to create the XAML page and then pull it in. And I figured I'd just show it to you here um, in an application that I built last year for .NET Comp, funnily enough. Uh, let me close a few of these IDEs out. Save that all out. There we go. Close that out there. And what I have here is an image search application. Now, an image search application uses native iOS and Android user interface. It enables me to go off and use Bing uh, or, uh, 
sorry, Microsoft Cognitive Services to use the Bing API to pull down images for anything I search for and do um, um, Cognitive Services emotion detection on any of those images and also using a camera to pick the actual user interface, or sorry, to pick a photo and then see the emotion results there. So what I have here inside of this shared project, so if you've already started down the Xamarin native route or looking to start and you have a really image heavy application, what I have here is the Android with all of the resources. There's all of the Android XML. I have a full iOS storyboard application there. Um, and those are all for the great screen on the front. So what I have here is the actual application. There we go. And when I select, um, select this button to say cute monkeys, it's going to go off and search for all the cute monkeys that it can using the Bing results. And it comes back in a recycler view displaying all those images. So it's very image rich, intense. I'm using car views, really customized with floating action buttons on these different things. But what I wanted to be able to do is just tap on a photo and go. And that's where here I can just look at this details page right here where I've created a cross-platform XAML. So I have a scroll view, I have an image here using an image link, I have labels and buttons, and I actually have an activity indicator right there. Now in Android, to pull this in, since it's in my shared code, what I can do is come into my details activity and it only takes one line of code to convert it. I initialize Xamarin Forms, I say, hey, go create that details page, I'm gonna pass you that information and create the fragment. And then I just have to swap the fragment out. So in this call right here, I'm converting it from Xamarin Forms down, because it's already an actual native page, into a fragment for Android. So as I tap on one of these monkeys, it will then navigate across to the screen, and I can analyze the image if I needed to, which will try, and some monkeys, so I can't get the face, um, recognition. I can still have access to the full toolbar, anything that I want. And I can search for, let's say, um, someone else. Let's see if we can do... Um, Let's say Miguel de Acaza and search there. It's looking good. There's Miguel. He looks very happy in this photo. We can analyze the image and he's looking ah, sort of happy. And I can still pull in all that shared code right into the application. I can set the iOS application as the startup in this sense. And I have a full iOS storyboard. But let me go ahead and set the iPhone simulator here. I'm going to go ahead and launch the iPhone 5S simulator. Now again, what's important here is I'm actually doing a full compilation of my iOS. I'm actually paired to my Mac that we can see right here. And this is going to do a full compilation, pull in the entire storyboard, and actually launch a remote iOS simulator for Windows. And we'll see the same exact view that's going to be rendered but for iOS. So let's give it a second here to actually compile up the application and see it launch. And while that's compiling, let me answer a question or two. Can, all, can this all be loaded to the platforms and release? Um, I'm not sure what that question means. So you'll have to ask me, follow up to me on Twitter, um, at James Montemagno. Let's see, how, can, how are NuGet packages that do not target .NET Standard High handled by .NET Standard 2.0 libraries? Um, well, we saw in the keynote earlier that you can just go ahead and bring those in and recompile um, into the application, or the library creator will update them uh, if needs be. There's one more. Is it pa? I'm not sure. We got to have crew back there cl clear out some so I can answer a few more questions as this recompiles. And hopefully my connection is still good. Um, and what we can see here, let me go into the source code of what it looks like. So as soon as I tap on that actual page, we'll see that the details page is created. And I have one call out to the source code to essentially create the view model. Let's see if we'll give it a second here to uh, compile and actually redeploy. And if not, Trust me, it all works, which is awesome. But I have a very complex, really crazy setup, a lot of demos going on here. Um, so let's see if this will all compile up into this application. We'll give it a second here. There we go. One or more errors occurred. So we're in a kind of complex scenario. We'll see if it'll deploy, but I don't think so, based on some weird networking issues in the studio. No problem. All right, cool. So to finish it off, we saw in Mac OS, development being brought over to Android, iOS, Mac with Xamarin Forms, cross-platform native user interface, shared native code with plugins for Xamarin, shared beautiful libraries with Skia Sharp, those micro charts, um, Erho Sharp for 3D graphics, using workbooks to learn all these great APIs. And all you have to do is install Visual Studio. Go to visualstudio.com.
to learn about um, how to install it on Visual Studio for Mac or Visual Studio uh, 2017. Now, what's also cool is that Xamarin University is going to be here for the next few days teaching you all this great stuff that I showed you. But you can also check out university.xamarin.com for the free self-guided to learn all about Xamarin and building applications with Xamarin, iOS, Android, and of course, Xamarin Forms cross-platform XAML. And that's it. It's been awesome. .NET Conf, I hope you loved it. Make sure to watch the Xamarin Show right here on Channel 9. And follow me on Twitter if you have any questions that you couldn't ask during it, at James Montemagno on Twitter. And with that, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of .NET Conf. And go download Visual Studio and start building beautiful, native, cross-platform mobile apps with Xamarin.